William Shakespeare, and this our life, exempt from public haunt, finds tongues in trees and books in running brooks and sermons and stones and good in everything. I think what the bard was telling us was that the landscape and wildlife as muse has much to teach us. This is a very small piece of real estate. It's a big piece of postage stamp, maybe three centimeters by three centimeters. And found on that beautiful piece of fall sphagnum, there's a cloudberry and some rosemary and some kinnikinnick berry, maybe a little bit of something else. So four or five species on something that could fit on the palm of your hand. If we take that to a much bigger scale, we've got our gorgeous southern Saskatchewan grasslands the limitless skies, and if you're lucky enough, on a fine spring morning when there's still a little frost on those branches, and the sun rises low, you'll see refracting light coming through like little Christmas lights. The southern Saskatchewan grassland is one of our main ecosystems. It grades to the north to forest. And on those grasslands, water is life. We don't fear those events. We don't fear the storms. We just live and love the water. You can't go for a hike along the grasslands or something like Grassland National Park without encountering these wonderful, majestic beasts, the bison. It's hard for me not to imagine, as I do my walks about there, about the First Nation people who preceded the Europeans and have been here for millennia. That animal represents, it represents sustenance, it represents tools, it represents clothing, it is both a spiritual and a real factual connection with the living world. Only in southern Saskatchewan can we still go and see areas where the deer and the antelope play, where the bison and the antelope can roam without fence line. If we cruise a little further north, we get into the boreal forests. And the boreal forests are deep and green like this white spruce stand. Or we have the mixed wood stand with gorgeous colors, each wearing their fall displays or perhaps an aspen parkland, and if you look carefully, you'll see that it's providing shelter for the green trees coming up underneath them that'll be the more mature forests. These northern forests are full of spectacular species, something like the loon on Golden Pond, a white-tailed deer who's throwing his nose up in the air and trying to sense either predator or perhaps a new mate that he might entreat himself with. And these are raucous redneck grebes calling their mates early in the spring, soon after their arrival. And no picture show of the boreal forest would be complete without a little shot of something like our prairie lily. And last on this little boreal tour, I'll show you a picture of a majestic elk. To walk upon them and disturb them in his bed is to wonder whether or not he thinks that I'm a predator coming to get him or just a two-legged creature invading his space. So I believe that there are lessons that we can take from these wonderful encounters we have with animals. I tell you, I spend hundreds of hours in the field, which means a lot of time just sitting there watching. And they're not just beautiful pictures, although we can take them anywhere. There are many little lessons that can be learned along the way. And the first of these, that I'm sure you all agree with, is that of mindfulness. Animals, by their very nature, have to be mindful of everything around them. They have to be cognizant of changes of season, changes in day length, the availability of mates, the presence of predators. They cannot afford to be otherwise. What about us? How easily do we cruise through life in our own little cocoons without paying attention to the other important things around us? And here a gray wolf is less concerned about my presence in the bush than it is about a snapping twig off to the left-hand side. Or perhaps have you ever watched a red fox hunt in snow? They cock their head from side to side. They listen for the little rustlings underneath what are called subnivian tunnels. Those gorgeous little tunnels, the little micro teams like red back bulls go running through. And then they pounce with unerring accuracy. And even in sleep, something as small and sensitive as a horned grebe will always have one eye on the horizon. A snowy owl focused on its prey. I watched this owl on a perch about a quarter mile away when this little mouse came scurrying out of the reeds. It was phenomenal to watch that owl's head swivel and launch, and then it came. It was so attuned to the natural world 
that it struck with unerring accuracy. So being mindful of our surroundings is the first small lesson I think that we can learn. We tend to drift, we tend to go about our daily business without paying attention to so many of the important things around us. So let's try and be more mindful. The second of these I'm going to have to talk about is what biologists like to call the trophic structure of life. Big words, not really all that important. But you all remember probably from your high school that we have a big broad base with lots of green stuff. We call those photosynthetic organisms. They're plants, they have chlorophyll. They're able to suck up carbon dioxide, breathe out oxygen. And in the process, using sunlight as an energy source, they're able to produce green stuff sugars and starches and cellulose and lignans that can be eaten by the rest of the organisms in the ecosystem. So at the base of all our ecosystems is this huge and fundamental base that we call the, the autotrophic layer. As you jump up a layer, we move into another important group of organisms called the herbivores. And here are some larch sawflies devouring a beautiful little larch tree, a young larch tree. So at this layer, we have a large number of invertebrates. We can have majestic ungulates like the mule deer in southern Saskatchewan. And this is one of my favorite herbivorous creatures, and it teaches us a little parallel lesson. Every time you think you know what's going on, think again. I think that most of us would assume that a butterfly or a caterpillar is nothing but a herbivore. And here we have on our left two gorgeous little fritillary butterflies. And on the far right, you see something called a Melissa Blue. So the title for this one is Fritillaries Feasting on Fecal Mounds. <laughs> so the next time a butterfly comes and perches on your finger, the end of your nose, <laughs> you might want to consider a handy wipe. <laughs> now, another little interesting thing about this butterfly is that what do they do that for? Why are they feeding on the fecal mounds? And the more often you're out there, the more inquisitive you are about life, the more you learn. And it turns out that there are little micronutrients, amino acids and proteins, which are found in the fecal mounds of many mammals, which are absolutely essential for sperm production in males. So there we have the magic fecal mound. Our next layer is upper called the omnivores. What I'm trying to do here is to draw an analogy between, in a second, between our businesses and our workplaces and our communities. And I want you to think about this big, broad base and progressively narrowing tower as we move up. So the omnivores, and I use that word carefully because most of them cannot afford to be just one species. They have to be very broad in what they're doing. And here a little golden eye dock, perhaps the gorgeous coke of a grackle or a Canada goose or even the red fox, which is just as happy eating berries as it is devouring a little mouse. They have broad bases in their diet, which gives them some resilience and some comfort. And here we have a picture which reminds us of the importance of families. The eared grebe, with babies on board. Another species that has a very broad range of prey items that it will select in its own aquatic ecosystem. And last on my choice of omnivores, before we move to our next layer, is that of the black bear. And black bears are huge animals, but they cannot afford, we always think about them as being carnivores because they're big and imposing and have these big long teeth. But it turns out that the black bear is as much an omnivore, a vegetarian as it is anything else. And so they have this multifaceted reliance on all different elements within its ecosystem. And this particular black bear was looking in my little cloth line and as a friend of mine said, you're lucky he didn't come for a ham sandwich. And then one of my other colleagues said, not to worry, they only eat lean meat. <laughs> At the top of our ecosystems, we have a group that we call the apex predators. These are almost always strictly carnivorous. They're highly specialized in their diets, and they are a joy to behold, which is going to be another little lesson for us. As a wildlife biologist or as a photographer, there's nothing that gives me a bigger thrill than coming across something truly rare and unusual. Those rarities that we find in the world are treasures that we behold, but how often in our societies do we marginalize the unusual or the uncommon? How long do we never not embrace those? So an apex predator could be a river otter, it might be a gray wolf in the forest, or it might be a golden eagle. So let's consider for a second, thinking about our triangular model, 
what would happen if a golden eagle, who is sacred to so many cultures in North America, were to spend its entire day aloft and disconnected from the rest of the organisms in the ecosystem? Sure, you'd have a great view, a great view and would probably have an extraordinary sense of what's about to come over the horizon. But without being grounded, that ego would soon perish. Perhaps there's a lesson in there for our business leaders and our politicians. And I think we've seen what's happened recently in our federal elections. So the trophic election, it's dominated, whether it's a business place or a community or a political system. If we focus on the foundational level and spend most of our energies there, if we recognize that there are progressively fewer organisms as we go up, if we recognize that the true functionality in an ecosystem depends on the interconnectedness of all things, and then we can accept that there are room for progressive specializations as we move towards the top. Biodiversity. Two quick stories about my mother, actually. When I was a very little boy, I remember coming home one time saying, so-and-so down the block was not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Mothers are pretty clever creatures. And my mom turned to me and said, Ham, have you ever tried to butter a piece of bread with a steak knife? What was she telling me? To embrace the diversity within our own genetic pool. Also, she lay dying a large number of years later on. I was in a hospital and sitting there reading a magazine as one tends to do in those, those depressing moments and waiting for her to pass. And I picked up a magazine. In the back of the magazine, there was a picture. And in that picture, there were six bags, six plastic bags, each which had one gorgeous colored tropical fish. Six plastic bags, six gorgeous tropical fish. And the caption underneath said, does this remind you of your organization or your community or your workplace? What do we do? So I made it kind of a mission 15 years ago to do my best to break the bags, to bring diversity alive, and to try and teach it in our classrooms, and hopefully periodically to be given the opportunity to share things like that in lectures with people like you. Biodiversity is absolutely essential in an ecosystem. Wherever we have biodiversity, it leads to increased stability and increased resilience and increased interconnectedness. And as I mentioned earlier, biodiversity is where rarity is treasured, it's valued, it's measured, it's the thing we take care of as biologists. And can't we do a better job as human beings about taking care of the marginalized people in our society? Managing change, perhaps another little lesson. Life is not kind and it's not always predictable. Uh, things like a forest fire can come through and radically alter an ecosystem. A flood might do the same. Uh, pestilence in the forest, uh, insect infestations. Any one of these things can dramatically alter a landscape. Just like in our lives, change can happen unpredictably and throw things on its ear. But if you're patient and you let it work its course, usually what happens after a catastrophic event is a rebirth, it's a renewal. There are young, better, smarter animals that come in, they form their homes, and we go through a whole other cycle of succession. And we start to accept that as part and parcel of life. Some of these agents of succession can be created by animals, and an animal that comes to mind immediately is the beaver. And in those cases, the beaver creates this wonderful mosaic in the forest from which all other animals can thrive. So this now leads to my topic, I'm gonna talk about keystone species. The wolves in Yellowstone National Park have completely changed the ecosystem down there. Wolves were absent for over 100 years. And recently they acquired some packs from Canada and reintroduced them. And they started knocking down the elk and moving around the elk and moving around the bison. And the vegetation is coming back and the streams are getting protected and the ecosystem is shifting. That wolf is punching way above his weight. He's enabling something new to come in. So we also see the same thing with the beaver in the boreal forest or perhaps pine beetle infestations in BC right now. We fear them because they're changed and they're unpredictable. But they usually bring with them dramatic and often a much improved environment. So let me introduce and suggest to each and every one of you, you're here today, you're interested, you're at a TEDx talk. What about if we consider ourselves as keystone players within our own species? In the summer of 1985, there was a piece of agricultural real estate near Chamberlain, Saskatchewan. 
and it brought in more income every year from crop insurance than it did from any crops which are grown on it. The Saskatchewan Wildlife Federation, under the leadership of a good friend of mine who shared these two photos with me, uh, Jim Crocious, they purchased this piece of land. And for 30 years, this was taken just a couple weeks ago, for 30 years, they nurtured the autotrophic base. They planted trees, they tended weeds, and now if you go back to that same piece of real estate, it's a dramatically improved, it's biodiverse, it's rich, it's stable, it's multifunctional, it's not all native grassland, but it's found a job for both man and wildlife to live together. My contention is that each and every one of us in our lives has opportunities to become keystone players. By the conscientious effort, directed usually at the autotrophic base, the things that we support, in my case, it's students at our institute, focus on them consistently over a long period of time, and you can see dramatic improvements in your own communities. This is not a kind world, it's sometimes unpredictable, but species like the white-tailed deer have shown their resilience and their toughness to adverse weather conditions. When I mention rarity, here we have an interesting little species from the southern, there's probably only a dozen breeding pairs, the red, or sorry, the black neck stilt with those gorgeous red legs. As biologists, we don't isolate these rarities. We bring them into the fold and we manage them and we provide habitat for them and we nurture them with the hopes that they will find an increasingly more important part in the systems in which you work. Can we do better with people? We embrace diversity and competition as biologists. Here are two diving ducks, a redhead duck and a ring neck duck, competing over a common piece of pond. Diversity is part of life, this is competition. Let's embrace it and let's see where it can lead us so that we each become particularly good at our own walks of life. Let us never forget to take care of our offspring, for they are the very foundation of the next generation. You can spend hundreds of hours out there watching and it's extraordinary the importance of parental care and nurturing and nest selection. Where are you gonna build your nest? Where are we gonna build our homes? What is the infrastructure gonna be like? They're critically important for success. And this, as we move forward in life, these are two water striders sitting on an eddy on a fast moving stream. And if you look really carefully, you might be able to see that they're, they're mating right now. This is a triple X show, folks. <laughs> but they're causing an impression on their environment. They're not destroying it. Their presence is being felled. They're treading lightly on their living environment. But clearly, they're making an impression on that environment as well as purportedly themselves. So my plea to you is to, like the black turn, is to elevate yourself, pick yourselves up. Think about some of the models that we've got working in our gorgeous natural ecosystems across Saskatchewan. Embrace diversity, function on taking care of those organisms at the base of our communities, at the base of our institutions, at the base of our businesses. Ensure high degrees of interconnectedness up and down the chain so that the top talks to the bottom and that most of us as players in the middle don't talk about top-down management or bottom-up management, but what we truly embrace is our own roles as critical linchpins, critical connections, critical zones of connectedness in that whole ecosystem. Thank you.